the whole world has been watching and waiting for the great Russian air force to break its chains and to change the course of the war in Ukraine. Those poor useless Russian troops are constantly looking to the skies in a vain hope of jet-based salvation. Thus far, their prayers have gone unanswered. They failed very early on to achieve air superiority in the conflict, but all the air force has managed to do is to play a supporting role in Putin's invasion, which some, including Dark Histories, believes is one of the main reasons for the poor performance of the Russian armed forces in general. The Russian Air Force is being used episodically, mostly to support the armed forces on the front line, said Leonid Nasishian, a defense analyst and research fellow at the Armenian Research and Development Institute. If I can just take a moment of your time and ask you to drop a like and subscribe. Your support is very much appreciated, and I hope you will become a member of the community. Putin has spent billions of rubles modernizing Russia's air force over the past decade. Many understandably predicted that Russian air power would quickly overwhelm Ukraine's defenses gaining free reign in the skies over Kiev. But heavy losses in early March pushed the Air Force to adopt safer tactics and a move to playing a subordinate role to Russia's ground troops, something analysts have attributed to the inexperience of pilots in Russia's recently modernized fleet as well as the differing Russian approach to the use of air power in combat. After suffering heavy losses in the first 10 days of March, Russia was forced to revise its approach and has remained risk-averse in Ukraine said Guy Plopsky, an independent Israeli defense analyst focusing on the Russian military. Unlike NATO which would look to establish its dominance in a war by flying complex sorties to root out enemy air defenses, gather intelligence and eliminate enemy air infrastructure, Russia's air force has mainly been used in Ukraine as an extension of frontline power, a flying artillery for want of a better term. This has meant taking off from airbases in southern Russia and Belarus to fly rapid bombing sorties over Ukrainian territory at low altitudes. The fixed-wing aircraft Russia is primarily using to conduct strikes are the Su-25 ground attack and Su-34 strike fighter, said Plopsky. The Su-25s take off in pairs or sometimes in groups of four, ingress to a target area at low altitude, maybe 50 meters or less, and then lob the rockets and bank left or right and return back to base, he added. Such attacks have been unrelenting throughout the war. According to recent figures cited by General Sergei Surovikin, the new head of Russian operations in Ukraine, Russia has flown a total of 34,000 combat sorties in Ukraine since February 24, or roughly 150 per day. Of course, this number should be taken with a pinch of salt. Those sorties have almost exclusively been launched from the Morozovsk, Milorovo, and Taganrog air bases in the Rostov region, Baltima air base in the southern Russian region of Voronezh, as well as the Sarki air base on the annexed Crimea. August, Sarki, took some significant damage from an unexplained accident that destroyed nine Russian jets, further reducing the Russian capabilities. But while these tactics have allowed Russia to limit its losses in Ukraine, analysts estimate that they have also impacted the level of air support its jets can offer. Without the intricate multi-aircraft sorties required for intelligence gathering, Russian pilots are often reliant on ground troops to provide them with target coordinates. This of course has caused huge problems due to the retreat and lack of experience amongst the frontline troops. We send them the coordinates where Nazis are located and we are very pleased when they are shelled, said one post on reverse side of the medal, a pro-war telegram channel with alleged links to the Wagner mercenary group. Dubious intelligence and the use of unguided munitions means strikes by jets are often ineffective, Plopsky said. Far from all the targets Russian jets have struck are of military value. Civilian targets are also known to be deliberately attacked, though in some cases a pilot might not even be told what exactly he's bombing, he added. Despite all the money spent, the technology on board its aircraft has been shown to be way behind that used by NATO air forces, with pilots having to rely on handheld GPS units and more ominously flying by landmarks, which often degrades their accuracy, and alternatively puts them in a vulnerable position for attack by ground forces. Russia's approximately 7,500 pilots have also been criticized for their lack of experience, but who can blame them directly with their flying time set at roughly 100 hours per year? That is an abysmal one-third of their NATO counterparts. They're decent at attacking pre-planned targets, but dynamic targets are a weakness, Plopsky said. Those dynamic targets require the real experience, and the Russians simply don't have it. Following the Ukrainian military's counteroffensive on the Kharkiv region in September, Russian units quickly deployed the air force in the hopes of halting Kiev's progress, but thus far they have been unable to prevent the rapid Ukrainian advance which saw them recapture 10,000 square kilometers of territory in just days. Much of the Russian Air Force's limited capability is owed to the difference in Russian military doctrine, 
said Sam Cranny Evans of the Royal United Services Institute, a British defense and security think tank. The Russian Air Force is viewed quite differently in Russia to air forces in the West. They are mostly an extension of the artillery and designed just to add a lot of firepower to frontline operations, Cranny Evans said. Failing to bolster Russia's frontline offensives, which have largely ground to a halt in recent weeks. The cost of operations has been steep in terms of material and personnel losses. The website Oryx, which measures losses that are verifiable currently has a total the total number of combat aircraft losses at 62. What shouldn't be ignored are the helicopter losses, currently sitting 57, including 25 Ka-52 alligator attack helicopters. The number of losses as a result of equipment failures has been staggering, and recently it was reported that an Su-34 crashed after its engine burst into fire. The incident happened in Yeysk, southern Russia, and resulted in the death of 13 civilians. An Su-30 fighter jet also crashed into an apartment building in Irkutsk, Siberia, killing the crew. The uptick in these types of incidents points to a lack of maintenance and spare parts, and highlights the effective of countless sorties flown by the Russians. Moscow's forces have begun leaning heavily on drones to launch aerial attacks on Ukrainian positions. According to Surovikin, Russian forces have flown 8,000 unmanned sorties since the beginning of the conflict, relying on the Air Force's domestically produced four-post R and Inokhoditz drones, as well as a recent shipment of Shard 136 drones from Iran. These tactics have enabled the Russian Air Force to continue striking enemy targets and degrading Ukrainian air defenses, while minimizing its own exposure to risk. But they are not cost-free, with Oryx site is currently reporting a total of 142 drones having been lost. This excludes kamikaze-style drones, like the Shard. In conclusion it is safe to say, that the once much vaunted Russian Air Force is no more, in its stead is a husk-like object operating on autopilot and where the pilots are forced to fight to survive, rather than fight to win. Thank you for watching, we hope you enjoyed the video and we look forward to seeing you again soon.